welcome. Thank you guys so much. And welcome to our panel discussion, The Better Way, Strategies for Standing Out from the Crowd. Um, our esteemed panel, um, I'm excited to, to join you all. We actually have um, one panelist that wasn't able to join us. So you guys get to talk even more. <laughs> and we'll just share the mics um, here. So with the AI revolution, we have entered an era where our competition is fierce. And we all know in this room today that um, innovation is really the key. Businesses face the daunting challenge of setting themselves apart from the crowd. And that's really what our panel wanted to talk about today. Um, you know, with um, all the new innovations, with this AI revolution, there's so many unanswered questions. And I know all the panelists today will be talking about different elements of that. And what we're going to focus on is how to stand out. It's highly competitive these days. And um, we're going to share some ways to maybe be a little unique in this space. Um, with that, I'm going to have each of you introduce yourselves. And we'll start with Danilo. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Everton, Alexis, and all the uh, Compass team for the opportunity. My first time in Boston, so for me, it's a special moment. Um, I have a, a long uh, experience in finance industry, especially in payments. And I was uh, CIO of Cielo, for example, it's a big acquiring company in Brazil. For the last four years, uh, I had the opportunity to, to lead IT in the health industry, totally different experience to look for the patients, to look for the physicians, and some uh, good experience on that um, industry. And now I just returned to the finance industry, this time for a bank. Uh, today I am the CIO and the COO of BS2 Bank. BS2 is a bank focused on companies. We have a huge uh, portfolio of products like credit, uh, EFX, uh, payments, and also bank as a services. So thank you for, for the opportunity and good to be here with you. Thank, thank you. It's working? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here representing Anima. And congratulations to, to all the Compass team. It was, it was a, a pleasure to, to hear a Brazilian song at the piano playing by one of your executives. It was very, very nice. And um, I, I've been working with IT for a long time, so I have the opportunity to, to see so many technologies and so many hypes, and we are facing another one now with artificial intelligence. So it's, it's been good to be here and, and listen to, to you all. Okay, I think Fernando, we've got you next. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what you do? Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, good, uh, good evening for all the online guys that are watching us here. Uh, thank you so much, Compass team, for the opportunity of being here at the Harvard Club of Boston. I'm Fernando Moulin, and as a matter of fact, I used to be an executive just like you guys. I've been working in a lot of industries, over a lot of industries, uh, for more than 20 years. And now I'm a partner of a company called Sponsorbee, who happens to also have 20 years of experience. We deliver services to a lot of big corporations all over the world, especially in Brazil. And I'm an enthusiast of the new technologies, of innovation. So I've been uh, having the chance of leading a lot of transformation now in my clients and before in some companies. And as a professor, I teach uh, some cool stuff that I'm also uh, willing to listen from you in the following panels. But today, my, my, my major intention, my, my most important intention is to share with you some perspectives from how to make real impact. That's what we do at Sponsorbee. So uh, we're talking a lot about artificial intelligence, right? But how do you make real business of that? I mean, that's the key question that I would like to follow on in our panel, and I hope we can all help you uh, deliver more services or solutions to your customers. And Perry, Mason, you're up next. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Lisa. Uh, 
Yeah, very excited to be here. Uh, first time in Boston um, and made it to Harvard, so I'm excited. <laughs> um, so my name is Perry Mason. I am the head of digital at Territory Studio. Um, Territory Studio are best known for their work on futuristic interfaces for Hollywood feature films and um, designing uh, what, how technology is represented in culture. Um, my job as the head of digital is to try and create some of those things for real. So a lot of my work is across um, how to integrate AI into things like augmented reality experiences, representations for brands, um, and things like designing HMIs in, uh, in cars and, and other vehicles. So it's very broad, um, but very exciting. I get to play with lots of new technology and uh, bring it to life. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. We truly have a global representation in the room. I know we've got on the panel today Brazil, UK. I'm based in Atlanta. And um, with that, let's get started. So uh, Danilo, I'd love to hear how tech can create unique value propositions for businesses. Um, as a CIO, I know the CIO role can sometimes be perceived as somebody who just helps implement systems, but it's so much more than that. Can you tell us a little bit about your perspective of the role of C CIO and how that's evolved? I know you've experienced some different eras over uh, your um, career path. So tell us a little bit more about today, how that CIO role is going to be impacted. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe this is a, um, have here three examples to really help to create value. One of is this one related to the CIO role. I believe the CIO uh, has participated as a strategic person uh, during the, the company strategy definition and really trying to really influence the decisions. It's not easy because to, to do that, uh, the CIO has to, to understand the, the business a lot almost at the same level of the business areas uh, to really have the discussions and discuss the opportunities in a high level way. Uh, in general, the CIO has a very uh, good uh, and strong knowledge about uh, the, the operational process, but sometimes are not using that in a strategic way to really uh, influence the company. So using this knowledge, the CIO can really, in my opinion, influence and help the company in, in the, the strategic discussions and not discuss IT separate of the business. Uh, put technology as uh, a strategic pillar um, enabling the strategy of the company, not think separate. Again, it's not easy because the CIO has to, to manage all the IT, the infrastructure, the systems, everything that we are doing now, and uh, innovation, AI, but uh, I believe really to, in this, in this uh, strategy to really, really move the, the IT from a cost center to a business center. And again, it need, demands time, it's not easy. I believe the CIO can develop some um, soft skills to do that, like relationship, uh, adaptability, curiosity, and other ones that in general is, are not the the soft skill that we are developing the day by day. So uh, I believe on that and, and really this is one of good example to, to really increase the um, developer proposition. Other two ones that before I pass to my colleague is here is a customer experience. It's related because the CIO should understand better the genre of the customer. I think Shawn was talking about a little here about that. But I believe the CIO needs to go deep in the customer experience to understand customer segmentation, to really influence also the journeys, and not to be only the, the last mile of the discussion when the designer or the other areas can prepare everything. So I believe the CIO can help a lot in this cross strategy too. And of course, in the end of the AI, that is the, our focus here, that I'm gonna hear about my, my, my colleague is here, uh, how to uh, create in unique values. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Antonio, I know you had some thoughts too. How can um, a CIO really elevate a business? 
It's it's interesting because although we are facing so many innovative cases here, and we we are talking about in artificial intelligence. On the other side, in the day-to-day -day operations, we still struggle with uh, basic situations. And we still uh, listen to some phrases like, oh, we should align IT and business. And for me, this is not a, a good position because IT is business as any other area in the company. So we, are, we, are, we can't be aligned. We are the same part of the, of the company. So I think this is, this is really what about digital transformation, the change of this mindset, the old-fashioned mindset of sitting like, like a, a, a marketer or a sales guy saying something like that, oh, your system, CIO, your system falls, and my goal is not be achievable anymore. No, no, it's our system, it's our goal. We are part of the same company, remember that. That makes total sense. I know at our company, WebJump, um, we are an Adobe Platinum Partner. We're really focused on identifying with our clients what are the business problems and how can we leverage technology to solve those problems because that's really where you see it as the ROI and, and how do these solutions that we've invested so heavily in uh, produce results. Um, and we, we really do have to have that perspective of being one and not so siloed across an organization. So, Fernando, um, tell us a little bit about some real-life examples uh, on how companies can find uh, the real value of business impact with um, technology. I know you had some examples to share with us. Uh, sure. I mean, I, let's go back to the real problem, right? What is the real issue? If you look at many papers that have been released over the last years, uh, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, all global consultancy groups, they're releasing papers, Deloitte, right, telling us, well, we have $1 trillion impact, $5 trillion impact, $10 trillion impact of implementing AI, gen AI cases and whatever. But where is this money? Where is it coming from? I mean, we, we see, we're seeing still a lot of industries, a lot of companies doing very small, very specific use cases. I think every one of you here, right, have been trying some, some specific cases, but they have limited impact. They're pilots. How can you jump from the real pilots to small pilots happening over specific parts of the organization to a real transformation, right? Well, going back to the previous question, for example, I have a vision that in 10 years from now, there's not going to be a CIO or a CTO. There shouldn't be. Just like there shouldn't be uh, any specific digital transformation leader. Because when we begin a new technology, the thing is, the fact is, is that we have to create literacy, right? People need to understand how it works. And then you spread the new competencies, the new capabilities across the organization, then the organization changes. And I don't see a future in, in short term where uh, any, any contributor, I'm telling any analysts right, on the field, they shouldn't learn or they shouldn't be able of doing something with AI, empowered by AI, or using technology. And therefore, perhaps that technology will be an enabler. And then we are helping redesign some organizations, even their structural levels, right, so that they can think of that future. Just like innovation. We have an innovation team. Come on, innovation is something that everyone should be looking for. right? And going back to the cases, one very interesting case that I know of, and some people here are going to talk about it, uh, is from uh, a very big Brazilian operator, a Brazilian carrier, one of the top 10 uh, carriers in the world. They have been, first of all, to implement AI cases, they have been uh, going back to the data, right, to the data, and then establishing a good organization of all the first party data that they have, then creating groups of people in every single business area that works with the data they have so that these guys know better which use cases will deliver value. And then they will, empowered by the AI capabilities, empowered by data capabilities, try and learn and test and implement and deploy new projects. And they have a coordination of programs using data across the organization. So I think that's a good way to move forward, especially in a big corporation. So it's a good example that I'm reminded of. 
And uh, not to, to extend myself too much, I'm seeing some examples in education, for example, right? Uh, a client of ours, which is not Anima, right? But anyway, a client of ours, these guys are going from the, the day I, in, I intend, I think of making a course, till the investment in media, till the, after five, four or five years period of paying my installments of my course, they are using all this data to understand the full journey, just like you mentioned, and then to forecast which new uh, customers that they have will look like better for a, a business, from a business perspective. And then they have improved their revenue capabilities, the potential revenue capabilities, 50%, so forth. I mean, this program has been running for six months. So. Yeah, and I think consumers and clients, are, they're expecting that. Um, that's raising the bar for everyone. Um, so speak a little bit about that, Antonio. Um, you know, with so much competition, it's not just about price. So how can we stand out in the crowd beyond just being uh, competitive on price? What are the other factors that consumers might be looking for? Well, I think it depends on the products or services that you, you have. In, in our case at Anima, we have a broad, a broad portfolio of courses and from, I mean, top high price medical course to uh, digital learning uh, courses that it's, it's different. Uh, the, the offering is very different. So when a student chooses to, to, to be with us for four or five years, um, basically, he sees much more than price. Of course, price is important, but he wants to 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 have the badge of our 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 uh, logo of our uh, institutions with him forever for his lifetime. But we still uh, have a, a, a big big part of our customers, our students. In um, um, may I say in. Uh, less privileged sector of the society, so the price is very sensitive, and we still have to, to, to look for that. So I think it depends, this answer depends. That's great. Okay, Perry, you're up. You have been working on some really cool cutting-edge projects. I know some you can't disclose to the whole group. Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> but can you tell us from a creative perspective, um, how can storytelling and branding really set a company apart? Is there a better way we should be approaching on how to build our brands? Yeah, so um, we work with a, a number of um, brands and technology companies and, and look how to implement new technologies. Um, ultimately, I, th I think the, the way businesses ap approach uh, the sort of new world with AI isn't too different from you know, the past. Ultimately, it's about setting a vision, it's about understanding your audience, uh, whether that's B2C or B2B, making sure there's value um, in what it is you're offering and working out a way towards it. I think uh, some of the things you were just talking about where that you can have initiatives and um, you know have different groups of people working on ideas, but ultimately, um, where I've seen that fail is sometimes those things don't have an end goal. They're, they're sort of just experiments. Um, the way we tend to work is help a client sort of track further ahead, think about what could be, so move from the possible to the plausible, um, and then you know, a bit further than that and, and help them understand where their brand could be in, you know, three to five years time. Um, I think an another sort of complication at the minute is that AI has got, is on this exponential curve um, where even the biggest technology companies can't really see six months ahead. You know, they can work towards something, but in 18 months time, it gets very blurry. Um, so, for us, it's, it's about helping them, helping guide these clients through, okay, ignoring what technology can do now and where you think it might be going, but what about if it could do that? Um, and nine times out of 10, you know, by the time you've gone through the process, someone's already figured it out and is on the right track. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's, the, the process is too different. I think the speed of change is the, the biggest um, thing and large established businesses aren't used to moving at that pace. That's the, uh, the biggest challenge at the minute. 
That's great. And I think um, what you've highlighted is really what, what all of us have, have been thinking about and talking about, and that's building trust, right? Finding the right partners to work with, um, ha having your clients and consumers um, build that trust in an era where there are quite a few unknowns in the world. So does anyone want to share some other examples about how to differentiate and to build trust? Danilo, I see you nodding down there. Yeah, I think I can share two examples, one in the health interest, another one, the finance one. And the health interest, um, my experience at DASA, DASA is a big uh, diagnosing hospital company in Brazil, with more than 20, 23 million customers in the base. So we had a very good experience using a huge data lake and uh, some algorithms, some journeys on the top. Uh, and one of, uh, this, of these examples is the, uh, to predict uh, the pre-diabetic uh, uh, patient. For example, a patient comes to, to make an exam and this patient doesn't know that he's a pre-diabetic. And using data and using algorithms you can identify that this guy can be a, have a big problem in the future. And we start the treatment before and we avoid that this patient becomes a chronic disease guy, uh, patient. So we move to, to take care of the disease, to take care of, of the health of the patient. And of course, the cost of the system dropped a lot. So this is an example that we, we have in, in production in Brazil using AI and a lot of uh, data and really achieve the patient and the industry uh, with intelligent and, and unique pro value proposition. I think another one that I was remember here, the acquiring business in Brazil is so developed and it's in, in card industry. And some companies like Cielo and all other big companies in Brazil can predict the sales that will happen in uh, Mother's Day, for example, in uh, uh, and uh, Christmas Day with a, a very strong um, assertive way. And uh, the interest uh, asked to these companies to create something like a, um, a business or a, um, a retail index to use in the day by day of the, all the, the sectors of the, the retail business in Brazil. And, and this is only possible if uh, you have a lot of information intelligence to really uh, understand the behavior of the, the sales, the customers, separate for each uh, sectors in the retail. And uh, in Brazil, it's a reality for a long time to use this kind of indicator to really predict uh, the sales and days like uh, uh, Mother's Day, for example. Two examples when we can create value using data, using intelligence, and of course, uh, a huge infrastructure and secure to assistance behind. That's great, and I think, yeah, it's gonna be very impactful. That predictive information is gonna be phenomenal and rapid. I, I would yeah. say, I, I would also like to share two uh, different examples. Great. One from the, the back end, another one from the front end, right? So uh, the first one is a uh, very large uh, global retail business, right? They, they sell construction parts, uh, supplies for uh, for everyone making a refurbishment or any uh, construction, and these guys normally they have more than 200k SKUs. And they have been using not not only uh, Gen AI. Gen AI now is the new fashion, but anyway, they have been using machine learning, all RPA, all techniques available to reduce uh, their stock levels and to increase their forecast accuracy per store, per online channel and integrating all the channels so that they can deliver better value to the customer, to each customer, considering, as you all know, that it's so tough, the logistics of this kind of operation, right? You have a very heavy uh, products, very small pieces or parts of products, and then uh, in that case, artificial intelligence has helped them increase their efficiencies by 25%. So that's something that I really recommend, uh, and you are not using that yet to, to apply, because you have the data, you have the channels, you have distribution, you have the sales forecast, you have the sales volumes. It's a tough modeling, but you can do it, right? And, and really then the cool. second streamline, thing is, Streamline the whole thing. You can streamline the whole thing and, and look at the end of the chain. What's the customer looking for in the store or in the online channel? Then 
go backwards, right? Uh, with the whole supply chain, even though window supply has been challenged after the pandemic, right? And the second example is very cool, it's very interesting because it relates to everything that you just said. It's a cosmetics company that they have been trying to use avatars in artificial intelligence to deliver automatic services. But with their customer base, they, they understood that the results were pretty much the same in accuracy and especially in customer satisfaction when they had human people that they trained over years working and interacting with their customers and they tried using artificial intelligence to answer back questions for six months and they rolled back. They rolled back. They said, no, 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 our satisfaction levels are equal or worse, so we're still not ready to deliver the services we want to render in a humanized way, the way it should be without human people. So they're using artificial intelligence now to deliver better scripts so that their customer representatives can help better their customers. I love that, and I think it's really important to remember how we resonate with a customer and um, you know, how do you balance that innovation with um, tradition and the human element. Perry, do you have any thoughts on that with regard to kind of balancing tradition and innovation and being authentic? Yeah, I, I think um, it's not always about automation and, um, you know, using data to serve a client. Um, I think empowering humans with, you know, the, those quick answers to questions or the right answer. Uh, I think we've all had the experience of being on a, on a call with a, I don't know, a, a service like a bank or something and being yes. put on hold or and actually taking a long time to get to the thing you actually need to happen. Um, and my hope, I guess, is that those things will be super powered with AI and save everyone a lot of time and headache. Um, I think the, the, there are like loads of opportunities for, for AI to help brands um, give better customer experiences. Um, provide services faster, provide products. Um, and then I think even further forward, there are opportunities for brands to, I guess, look beyond uh, segmentation, like use AI to help define their brands, to, to make better products, put them in the right places, make them very specific, um, you know, almost down to an individual basis. Uh, you know, what's the right product for an individual? Uh, rather than trying to group too many things based on region or um, yeah, other sort of personas that, that have, have been used in the past. Um, so I, I think there's lots of opportunity for brands to do good things with AI. Uh, I think the, the easy ones we're all very aware of, and you know, there was a big announcement yesterday um, from OpenAI, you know, what, what yeah. those things, uh, how they might behave. Um, I think ultimately that people's expectations have been elevated, much like when the iPhone came out, everyone now expects the touchscreen to work in a certain way. I think that is now happening with the next generation. They have expectations of how, I, how AI is gonna help them, and, and it's up to us to kind of deliver that. Yeah, I love that. I think you know, one of the, the big themes in, that I've taken away from our discussion is building that trust. Um, I know with the um, increase in, in competition, everyone is, is talking about AI, but really it comes down to you know, winning work, but also executing and having the expertise and knowledge. And I'd love for each of you to just give a final thought on uh, winning versus executing and how to, how to be better, how to set ourselves apart. Danilo, oh, Antonio, go ahead. Actually, I, I would like to, to take the, the, the final, the, the last question about the, the previous panel about yes. education, uh, about the need for transform the education because of the, intel the artificial intelligence and all these new technologies. And I want to say that I'm here with a colleague also from Anima, and we are very pleased to talk with anybody who has ideas about that, okay? <laughs> Looking for. I love that. Okay, go ahead, Danilo. Uh, may I uh, change a little the discussion or you can... I have changed. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, I was thinking here in, in, in provoke the group and trying to... Because we are talking here in, to create a value proposition, unique value proposition. Yes. 
to have the AI strategy. And I have a question. It's who here is really coordinating the AI adoption in your company as a leader? Who? Can put our arms? Show of hands. Can, there's a half. <laughs> yeah. I, I was not coordinating yet. And now I'm assuming this rule. And the problem is the company start to go alone. And then we start to have problems, of course. So I believe in, in talking uh, with the, the beginning of our panel. This rule is ours to really coordinate, to show the, to the company how we can prepare the architecture to really use the AI the best way, in a secure way, uh, keeping the, the privacy of the, 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 the customer and all the other strategies that we, we have to, to prepare, right? And not really connect the, the chat GPT and start to use. And, uh, and I believe we, we need help. Really, really, really needs a, a partner to do that, even in a big company, because it's not easy to understand all these things that is, is happening, and how you can really create something like the AI cockpit here. It's not easy because how okay, can you can access Copilot or other a lot of tools, but this is not the point. The point is how we can or orchestrate the process, how we can train the people to use how you can prepare in a model that you can have secured. So I think if we co coordinate this agenda, we have much more chance to really create value and to see the protagonist and being more propositive uh, around that, this point of discussion. Because if you not do that, probably the other guy will do it, right? And I think this agenda is ours. Thank you. Fernando, any uh, final thoughts? I think I have three pieces of advice that I would like to share with you, right? The first one is based on, uh, think about ourselves as individuals. We are all embracing and adapting and adopting in our personal lives these new technologies faster than we are doing as big corporations. So from a personal perspective, we have been capable of using wearables, ways, whatever, right? All, every single new technology over the last 15, 20 years, corporations are slower than individuals. And then these new consumers are forcing us to change. How can we be faster in changing internally? And it's tough. We know how tough it is, right? But anyway, that's the first piece of advice. I mean, we need to be faster. People are faster than we are being as corporations, right? Then uh, second philosophical question. Look at our audience here. How many of us are millennials or alpha generation? These guys interact and behave with artificial intelligence in a way that is very, very, very unique and much different from ours. So we need to incorporate their knowledge because they are the real customers for now and the customers for the future of our companies, right? So we're thinking of uh, with the past. We need to change. And then the third piece of advice is that we're all talking, just like you guys mentioned, we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, changes, scales, but the data, I was talking with AWS guys uh, some, some days ago, right? And, and most of the problems these guys face when helping companies implement AI transformation processes is that they, the data is not cleaned, it's not cleaned up, it's not good, it's not proper, it's not first party, so garbage in, garbage out, as you all know, right? So that, that's a structural change that's going to take years to help to happen. And then uh, we need to do that much faster than we used to do that in the past. Perry, any final thoughts as we uh, wrap our yeah. panel discussion? I, I agree with all, all of those three. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think um, I would say that the, the stories we tell around uh, these tools is really important important. Um, it goes alongside branding. No one really cares how things work. Consumers don't really care. They don't see it. Uh, all they see is the magic. So from my perspective, it's all about giving the user or the customer a really good experience and um, making sure that they find it exciting, find it valuable, and hiding 
not hiding in an unethical way, but hiding away the, the kind of uh, the back end side of things um, and just making sure people have a memorable experience, a memorable interaction with your brand. Uh, I, I think a lot of the things we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be a, an interface or driving a car, um, there, there's a lot of processing power in a lot of the things we use, even our fridges. Um, and the, the, the front end of um, those uh, machines or devices, or products, is the, the, pit, the bit that people will remember. Um, so, yeah, uh, th this is my sort of very biased view on it, but making sure those interfaces stand up to scrutiny, that they deliver what's expected, and surprise and delight, it's the same as we've all been kind of working towards for, for years, but um, we've got this opportunity to make it even better. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our wonderful panel and thank all of you for joining us. Um, I hope we've been able to give you some ideas and spark some ways uh, where you can differentiate yourself in a huge sea of competition these days. So thank you all so much.